All right. So uh, I want to introduce our speaker for today, Kate Kehi. Our title of the talk is Software X, a new open access software journal. Kate is one of the pioneers of infrastructure cloud computing. She created and leads the development of the Nimbus project, recognized as the first open source infrastructure as a service implementation and engages in many application projects, enabling the use of the cloud computing platform in science. She is the PI of the Chameleon Project, a distributed experimental test bed for cloud computing research, and a co-founder of Software X, a new journal format established to publish software contributions. Kate is a scientist at Argonne National Laboratory and a senior fellow at the Computation Institute uh, at the University of Chicago. Please welcome Kate to our telecon. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much uh, for inviting me to uh, to talk about uh, publishing software because it's obviously something that um, that is uh, near and dear to my heart. And, and I just wanted to say at the beginning, um, at this presentation, the slides here, were developed at the beginning of the uh, when, when the journal just started a couple of years ago um, by the publisher and probably need a little bit of a facelift. And since I'm talking to a community of scientists, um, I think I'd like to talk a, a little bit about what brought me to Software X and, and why I decided to get involved in this effort. Um, so I, I'll probably just stay on the first slide uh, for a longish time and then uh, move on with the presentation, which focuses on logistics of publishing and less perhaps on, on the reasons for publishing. So as far as the reasons go, um, as we had in the introduction, I, I lead um, a project called Nimbus, which was the first um, open source implementation of infrastructure as a service. Uh, infrastructure as a service system is uh, something like Amazon uses to provide um, uh, the uh, Amazon Web Services EC2. Um, it's it's something that OpenStack these days uh, implements, and it's, it's probably the most um, famous and most widely used implementation of that. Uh, Nimbus provided something very similar, and it was the first open source um, um, infrastructure as a service implementation. We had public release of the software in mid-2005, and of course, that was preceded by um, a lot of research. But what happened, you know, we released the software, we made it available to others, but we didn't publish it because there was, wasn't really a way to publish software. Um, and, and um, you know, as a result of that, um, the, the main way to reference Nimbus right now is just really reference the webpage for the project, right? Nimbusproject.org. And that's very unsatisfactory because and there isn't a year tied to that that you know demonstrates that we were first and, and so forth and so on. And while we of course published many papers on different aspects of the system, on you know different algorithms, for example, for deploying virtual machine images on nodes, uh, how fast that can be done, what is the um, overhead of, of running applications in virtual machines as opposed to uh, on bare metal Linux and so forth and so on, we published many of those papers. We didn't really publish. Uh, the software in any way, and, and thus it was very hard to get credit for um, creating the software. And yet that software enabled many research groups and provided very useful functionality to them. So, uh, you know, based on that experience, I sort of started thinking, this is not right. My team produces a lot of production quality software. People use that production quality software for various diverse uh, projects in, in domain sciences and in computer science. Why can we not get credit for something that is constitutes really the bulk of our engagement in science? And if you think about this, throughout history, um, scientists relied on various scientific instruments to perform their research and they were also recognized by, for it, right? So one of the one of the first instrument builders, scientific instrument builders, is uh, was Antoine von Leeuwenhoek. He was a, a Dutch draper who started doubling in science and ended up inventing the microscope that was so powerful that it could be um, used for microbiological research, right? For microbiological discoveries. Um, as another example, there was an English scientist called John Harrison who invented the marine chronometer. So obviously a very useful device. 
And, and they were recognized for their contributions to science. And in fact, Harrison received the Copley Medal, which is the most prestigious uh, scientific award given by the Royal Society. And, and you know, if you look at the at the co his co awardees and the range of people who received the Copley Medal, that includes very familiar names like Benjamin Franklin and Charles Darwin and uh, Albert Einstein and Dmitry Medvedev. I don't really have to explain to anybody what these people did. Those are household names that, that everybody knows. So these people made important discoveries, but clearly the, the invention of a scientific instrument was ranked at the same level as, as the important science that they, uh, that they performed. And of course, uh, over time, as those scientific instruments became more complex, uh, it wasn't just one person who would be credited with the discovery of a scientific instrument. Um, those would typically be uh, very large teams. Um, and and um, this, at some point, of course, people started using computers and, and started using software to build those scientific instruments. But at the same time, software, perhaps because it's so very new, doesn't get the same recognition as, as the construction of all those other scientific instruments, right? So for example, um, you know, another complex scientific instrument is the Large Hadron Collider at, at CERN, right? A lot of people, if you want to look at, um, at the list of authors, the people credited with its invention, you have to download a PDF paper because that's, uh, you know, a very long list. So anyhow, um, for software, uh, there isn't the same, uh, quite the same amount of recognition. And in fact, one of my, um, co-editors in Software X at some point talked to a colleague in CERN and, and that colleague said that software could not possibly be a scientific instrument because a scientific instrument is made out of metal, right? So there's clearly a, a certain mindset that uh, a scientific instrument has to be uh, in a way more tangible um, and, and software could not possibly be it. But um, computing is, is famously now the uh, fourth paradigm um, computing simulations are increasingly used as, as uh, instruments, computer science instruments. Uh, the recent um, activity in deep learning in particular is, is not just helping science, but also driving science, but by discovering correlations in, in various di different data sets that raise questions of causality, right? Are those correlations accidental? Or is there some phenomenon that we're not familiar with that, that could be discovered in this way? So software is, is, is becoming to be very much uh, like any other instrument. It's an essential enabler. It's a driver. Uh, very often is also uh, very complex, produced by um, uh, teams of, of numerous researchers. And it's, it's only fair that it should be recognized uh, in science. And, and how do we recognize it? Well, in science, what matters is citations, right? If people make their tenure case, it's important how much their work gets cited. So the uh, idea then arose that we need to change this uh, state of the art right now where software is not recognized as a, as a scientific contribution because it's not good for anybody and most particularly it's not good for science. So myself and a, and a few colleagues who discussed these matters for a long time came up with the idea that perhaps um, it would be good to create a, a journal um, that would make sure that the software instrument builders get the credits they deserve Right, the software is citable so that um, traditional metrics of evaluating scientific contributions and, and scientific excellence can be applied to it um, so that you know the career paths of software developers uh, can be fostered uh, because right now people who essentially devote their life to um, to uh, software development you know their, their their careers are very often hindered because software development does require a lot of effort. And if they put that effort in, into software, they're not publishing papers and that's uh, what's currently recognized. And then also so that software is given a stamp of scientific relevance, right? So that it's peer reviewed and, and recognized by the peers. And, and it, in, in some sense, we say, yes, this is an important scientific um, contribution. And of course, all the other things that pertain to making 
um, your research available to making your research public and open and, and allowing others to build on it apply as well, right? So it's important that the software is publicly available for inspection, that it's easy to find, that it's available for reuse um, as well. Um, so, um, so moving on with the presentation now, this was, oh, let's see about this. Ah, there we go. So uh, this, is, this is really a slide that, you know, recaps very briefly what I just said, right? Everybody uses software, a great fraction of people write software, and we need to make sure that those people get credit uh, for doing that, and, and, and that software is peer reviewed and has acceptance uh, within the community. Um, there is there's a little quotation here, by the way, from uh, a blog of uh, a colleague, uh, uh, Neil Chehong, at uh, University of Edinburgh. He's running something called Software Sustainability Institute, and it's another way, another um, open journal for publishing software. It's a little bit different than Software X, and, and I'll explain those differences later. So um, here's uh, just a, a, a few... Um, uh, pictures from a, a YouTube video that uh, that Elsevier came up with to explain what the original software publication is, right? So we're trying to give, uh, to treat software submission, software publication, as a first-class citizen. Um, some people call it the first-class scholarly artifact. Uh, Elsevier type tends to call it original software uh, publications. What could they uh, consist of? Uh, well, of course, there's, uh, you know, some information. So we need to know what the software is about, um, who the authors are, and some metadata. Metadata um, contain a description. I'll, I'll have a slide that explains it in more detail. Contain a description of what the software is, what programming language, what license, uh, you know, how to run it, um, and so forth and so on. So uh, like I said, this, uh, the, the pictures here um, are taken from a little um, video, and I'm not going to play the video for you because everybody can play the video um, on their own, but let me see if I can find it. I actually queued it up somewhere here. There we go. Get your software published in Software X. But if you, you know, if you uh, search for YouTube, Software X, Elsevier, things like that, um, I'm sure it'll come up as well. And it's just a quick informative uh, video about what, what uh, Software X is, why it was created, and, and how to submit. So um, here is the uh, editorial board of the journal. Uh, we've got three co-editors in chief. Um, I'm, I'm uh, obviously one of them. Um, another one is um, Professor uh, David Wallam, uh, a colleague of mine from Oxford University in, in the UK, and <clears throat> Dr. Randy Sabi from University of Victoria uh, in British Columbia. So this is, those are the editors in chief. Um, in addition to that, we've got uh, an editorial team of associate editors in various different areas. And that is because um, Software X is a multidisciplinary journal. So in other words, you can submit, um, you can submit software from various different disciplines, um, computer science, of course, but also environmental sciences, uh, medical and biological sciences, uh, humanities and social sciences and so forth. So we've got the, uh, the, the list of associate editors here it needs to be updated and of course they rotate. But the idea here is that, that software developed for, for one uh, discipline, for one domain, could well be uh, applicable to another. A an example could be uh, workflow management software. Um, in almost every area of science, there are processes that can be defined as a workflow. And if you have a, a system that manages workflow, it could be used in, in one domain or another. Sometimes, indeed, there are differences between those domains. Sometimes uh, there are um, uh, interaction patterns that are emphasized within one domain and not the other. And then, of course, it doesn't apply. But, but a, a, a large major, majority of software has the potential to apply across domains. That does present us with a little bit of a quandary because, and that's why we very strongly rely on our associate editor team, because um, you know um, everybody has expertise in on the one area of science. I'm a computer scientist, for example. Randy uh, Randy Sobi is a, a physicist, a high energy physicist. So uh, we we'll, we we'll both have very distinct sets of expertise, 
and sometimes it's difficult to evaluate which software is impactful. So that's why we have this editorial team uh, who works with people in, within their community uh, to evaluate the contributions. Um, so what, what I would like to emphasize is that this is what we're trying to do uh, here is it's not just journal about software. So in other words, you don't really just write a paper about your software and submit that paper. Um, we, the, the submission is organized around the software itself, right? So you, you submit the software itself, the software gets up, uh, uploaded to a, a GitHub directory that is run by Elsevier. And you, know, you may have your own GitHub directory, but this is the snapshot of your software in time. If anybody uh, later on comes and claims that the capabilities that your software provided at that time were already provided uh, or were not provided by your software or anything like that, you can point to it and say, this is, this is the snapshot of the software at, at that time, just like, just like you would in a publication published in a, in a specific journal, and, and it's going to be available to, uh, to all. Um, it's also available, of course, for you to use as a software repository, uh, but people sometimes prefer to have their own, you know, SVN or GitHub or, or whatever else uh, they use. So the, the main part of the submission is really, it's not a, an article, it's not a paper, it's a software. Now, there is, we do also, with the software, um, you know, ask you to tell us about the documentation that you have. We ask you about the, the metadata information about licenses and so forth. And we do also ask you for a, 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 about a five page paper that describes the impact of the software or provides the evidence of the impact of the software. And, and so there is a, a little article or a, a, a little, a very short paper that gets submitted. But the point of that paper is not to be the main contribution, but to articulate the impact on the community, on the science that your software has had, right? What new problems can we address with this new scientific instrument that you developed? Uh, you know, how can we streamline the scientific process and so forth? Um, uh, and, I, and I pretty much went over all the things that we have here in bullets. We do provide the, um, the GitHub directory. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Elsevier also has um, ScienceDirect and, and various other uh, tools that index the software and make it easier to discover, to search for and discover. Um, one thing, one, one quick um, word about licenses. Um, we do accept open source software because the idea, this is an open journal, software access open journal. And the idea here, of course, is that you, that you publish the software, um, you know, publish the code and, and share it with the community. And on the right here, you've got a list of various different um, licenses that apply. So if you have software licensed in this way, we can publish it. In practice, uh, many uh, investigators, many authors, have some modification of those licenses. So for example, MIT license is very often modified to uh, make it um, you know, more open in a sense um, uh, to, to
that's a very important part because uh, for many institutions also uh, they do find that um, you know if, if there's no career path for software developers uh, they are likely to look at industry and even people who are committed to science and who um, intellectually and and um, uh, you know morally would like to advance uh, science uh, they, they sometimes just simply uh, go to industry because uh, maybe because it offers better conditions but maybe also because the, it offers a more articulated career path for them um, all right so uh, for, for the next slide now what um, what does those original software publications um, uh, exist uh, consist of um, and again um, we, we Elsevier provides a directory that you can use in order to um, to download the software it provides the indexing by a science direct and and uh, searchable tools uh, by a scopus um, how do you so now 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 we get to the to the gist of this um, how do you uh, submit to software X so like I said uh, the, the gist of the submission, the, the main uh, part of the submission, is your software. Um, what you also provide is a short article that describes the impact that the software held in the research community. And the impact could be, you know, whatever evidence of impact can you provide. It could be, you could say, uh, you know, we've had uh, 100,000 downloads of the software. Um, you know, or you could cite some important discoveries that were made with the software or papers. Some people cite papers that were published using this software. Um, so in other words, whatever, whatever evidence of impact comes to hand, and it's not, you know, just one or, or three types of evidence, it's just sort of very free form. Uh, we're open to, uh, to interesting things there. And, you know, we've had in the past submissions that were, um, they were consisted of, of very complex software packages that were developed by many people over many years. But we've also had uh, submissions that were very, you know, relatively short MATLAB programs that, that contained an algorithm or contained useful functionality that was just simply used by many, many people in the community and, and helped people advance it. So there's a really wide range of, of what you could um, of you would submit. A very important part of the submission is, is a metadata table. The metadata asks you to provide information such as, you know, give us a link to the software. Is it publicly available? What is the software license? Do you have, does your software have documentation? Um, things like that. So you've got some description of, of the things we're asking for metadata um, on the left there. Now, um, while we do ask for evidence of the impact, sometimes um, software hasn't had a chance to make an impact yet. Sometimes it's, you know, in the making. Uh, in that case, uh, you know, the, the impact statement, if it describes what, what discoveries are in process making the software or, you know, why the community agrees uh, that this is the functionality it needs and so forth, uh, that's typically sufficient. Now, each, each um, SoftwareX submission uh, goes through a peer review and, and the main component of that peer review is assessing the scientific impact of the software. So, in other words, we're not uh, a certification program. We're not, we don't necessarily act, ask reviewers to compile and run the software. We, we do have some questions that, that we ask the reviewers to assess uh, about the quality of the software. You know, we ask for things like, um, for example, evidence of a build and test system, the quality of the documentation, the software structure, is it, is it readable? Does it have this uh, good cold smell then that, uh, you know, most software developers uh, will see? But we don't necessarily ask them to, uh, to compile and install it. And that is because we already ask for the assessment of the impact. And if a software has, uh, you know, hundreds of people using it, or if papers were written uh, using that software, then it's clear that, that at least somebody was able to compile it and run it and, and, and use it to, to produce useful results, right? So we don't want to be a, a software certification effort because inevitably in that case, some people will have different opinions on, on the software style than others. 
uh, what we want to provide is information about impactful scientific instruments instead. Um, I'm also not, um, you know, we're not competing with venues like, for example, R&D um, 100 awards, right? In, in a sense, uh, we're trying to complement them because um, R&D 100, uh, there's only so many people that, that can be awarded that award. Um, and, and there are many excellent scientific instruments that are being developed every day and, and bypassed every day. Um, so a, a few words about the software ex GitHub repository. Actually, let me um, um, let me show you. So uploaded here. It's uh, here's the the link to the repository. These entries here are um, software ex uh, submissions that were accepted. Uh, so, in, so you see that um, it's very multidisciplinary. We've got uh, Navier Stokes Solver. We've got uh, benchmarking, open source framework for benchmarking. We've got the uh, monitoring framework. It's very diverse also. We've got you know, MATLAB and Python uh, and C++ and, uh, and Fortran. I saw here some more Fortran. So um, really um, a, a wide diversity of software that, that you can submit here. Um, this repository is going to be maintained, so Elsevier uh, takes uh, responsibility for maintaining that repository. Um, it could be uh, particularly interesting if you're, for example, uh, working on a SEF grant and, and you're writing the data management plan or you're executing on the data management plan and, and you're saying the software developed under this proposal is going to be maintained and provided. So here you can say, well, you know, we will publish it via Software X or, or submit it to Software X, which will ensure the availability of this data. The software is an important type of data, uh, you know, essentially forever as part of the, um, the, um, the, the, the scientific artifacts. Um, so one, one thing that I wanted to encourage everybody is uh, maybe before publishing in Software X to become a Software X reviewer, because that uh, really gives you a first hand um, uh, insight into the process and into the components of the process, what it consists of. Um, uh, like, like I said earlier, software is judged based on, on the impact, but reviewers get, um, when you start reviewing, you get a, a template with many, many questions. And, and those are very detailed questions and they are very carefully thought through so that if you answer all these questions, at, at the end of answering all these questions, you will, you know, and as part of answering them, you'll probably, as, as a professional in this domain, you'll probably ask new ones. So at, at the end, after you answer all these questions, you will have, a, a, you know, good grasp of whether this is solid software, uh, an important scientific instrument that will generate many new um, insights for science or not. Um, so, in a sense, that review process guides you through towards uh, developing your uh, opinion on that. Um, and I'm and I'm mentioning it because many people are a little bit um, uh, unsure about the software process. So, because uh, because it's a relatively new thing to both publish software and review software, um, there, there are a lot of questions about criteria. So, we were trying to give reviewers as much information as possible. And as I already mentioned. Reviewers don't necessarily have to compile, run, and debug the code, certainly not debug the code. Uh, although we did have um, quite a few reviewers who at least tried to run the code and, and you know, came back with useful comments. Uh, and some of them said even, uh, that was fun. Uh, we're going to see if we can use that, um, that software in, in, in our work. So, so that's fantastic. That's um, uh, exactly what we're trying to do there. Um, a, a few words about future plans for uh, for software X. And there are quite a few of them. Um, uh, one is uh, there, there's an initi initiative called Code Ocean for testing the submitted software, uh, and you know you have to submit it in a certain format. And then there's this automated system that tests the specific tests that you formulated uh, whether it became behaves uh, as, as advertised. Um, a company software with example data, and that, that again goes uh, a little bit more to that uh, data plan, and and introduce more of a uh, more of a user friendly system. You know, you can think about it um, along the lines of of what Amazon is doing when you buy a book. It says, you know, oh, you like the software, 
you, you might find the other types of software useful as well, right? But those are those are um, things that uh, Elsevier is, is thinking of doing. Um, and just um, um, another uh, a, another potential little bullet for me is uh, I'm in very interested in questions of repeatability and reproducibility. So um, another, as you had in the introduction, another thing I'm doing is I'm, I'm running an experimental testbed for computer science. Uh, and it looks to me like publishing the software in some form that uh, allows others to repeat experiments is an extremely important part of the scientific process. So now linking a published software to potentially published data, which is also something that Elsevier is uh, considering and that of course many other people in science are considering how to best publish data uh, and publishing generally electronic artifacts and not just papers because papers are a summary of of your argument of, of the result you produced and, and linking those things together so that we can have uh, maybe a more profitable and more focused intellectual exchange is a big interest of mine so what i would like to see in the future of software x is for it to become uh one um one cog in in a in a in, in the machinery of um, ensuring reproducibility in science. Uh, and one last thing also is that Software X is a developing journal. It's not in any way finished. And like I said earlier, currently the, uh, the results, scientific results, are recognized by citations. This is just the, the prevalent way of acknowledging scientific contributions. And so we said, well, we want to publish software, we will create a journal. Right, just like you publish uh, papers in a journal, we will publish software in a journal, and we'll see what happens. But sometime down the road, those things may change, and it may become uh, easier, or it may become more relevant to publish software in different ways. And we're of course very open to that. So, so this is what I have, and I will take questions now. Hello. Uh, Kate, uh, yes. yeah, Kate, Jim Barry, thank you very much. Uh, very impressive. Um, I have a question, which is how are you doing with it, your impact factor as a journal? Uh, and what, uh, what do you mean by that? So the often when uh, in academia, uh -huh. when a journal is uh, evaluated, people look at its various impact factors how it rates accord other to other journals and from high to low obviously it's good to be high but um i'm just curious how and I, obviously it takes time to develop an impact factor that uh higher up the scale i'm just curious if you have uh, an impact factor and and how it's uh, been evolving yeah so you know uh, software x has been in existence uh, essentially for two years at this point and and the you know the, the first year we had i think one issue published the second year we had four issues published it's a little bit early to uh, i think to look at citations uh, of, of software x papers uh, we did however have um, you know, uh, quite a few people citing it. So it's, you know, just because the, the pipeline is, um, you know, at the beginning, I would hesitate to give comparison numbers with other uh, journals. Uh, but, uh, and, and it's something that we haven't looked at in a while. So I can't give you a, 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 a concrete answer right now, but it is a very interesting question. And, and I think that, um, I think that I would like to, to start looking at that again. Okay, thanks. Anyone else have questions? Yeah, hi Kate, thanks for this presentation. Um, what kind of metadata standard is uh, Software X using for these different code packages? Do you, is, is there one in particular, do you use several, or how does that work? No. So, so the metadata is the, the, the metadata format that we are using uh, has been specifically designed by uh, Software X at this point. It's obviously it's something relatively new. Uh, there are no standards for what metadata for a software publication should be like. Um, if uh, you know uh, people, 
those things are, are under development. So I, I did mention another software publishing journal earlier on, and there are several other efforts that are um, also publishing software and developing metadata. All those efforts are early on in their life cycle. So while we're looking at them and sharing um, information, uh, we're not at this point adopting one over the other. Okay. Or, or you know, it's too early to talk about developing standards, in, in other words. And, and like I said, uh, you know, at the end of the talk, we're very early in this in this publishing cycle, and we just said, well, um, you know, the traditional way is to publish journals, so let's publish a journal. But we didn't really, you know, we're, we're expecting this to evolve. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. Yeah, we're, we're looking uh, at different ways of creating metadata for the software packages that we're creating and just kind of exploring those options. So it sounds like even you two are uh, in the in that fluid process of identifying what works best. Thanks. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so, Kate, this is Bruce. Uh, I know Force 11 has a working group on software citations. Are you connected with that at all? Uh, which lab again? Force 11. Um, the Force 11, Force 11. Um, yeah, has a working group on software we, citations. And I wonder if that's, yeah. okay, is this informing your citation model at all? Yeah, we do. We do work with Force Eleven, and and of course we are uh, aware of their efforts. Um, it's again, it's it's one of those efforts that are it's not clear um, how to how to work with that, right? So it's one of those developing efforts that we are tracking, uh, but but not necessarily adopting anything. And and in in general, if you, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the the Software Sustainability Institute. Um, so one of the things that, and, and there was actually an error, I think, on one of the slides. Uh, one of the things that Neil um, has written, uh, he wrote a blog which has um, uh, links to multiple different efforts that are involved in publishing <laughs> software. And, uh, his collection is extremely broad um, and involves efforts from um, you know, from from traditional journals that publish software in addition to papers, right? Or the the, the software is, is somehow published as part of the paper. So you know, software is described in the paper, but we don't upload code or anything like that. Um, and you know, uh, again, it's a very um, it's an evolving scene right now. Uh, there are many um, uh, journals that do it for on the specific areas or on the specific types of software. Or, or things like that, right? And we're, we're, we're tracking all those efforts, uh, partnering with them where, where possible and reasonable, uh, but, but yeah, we don't have specific, uh, you know, thrusts in, in one direction or another. Okay, thanks. And I, I'm sure that all this stuff will evolve and co-evolve in the next few years anyway. Yeah. Okay, um, if nobody else has any questions, um, I want to thank Kate uh, for your uh, sharing your valuable time with us and giving us this presentation. And as Bruce said, it'll uh, end up online and, uh, and I'm sure we'll have many more viewers and you may get um, questions from them as well. So they can they write to you at uh, SoftwareX? Um, there is, uh, I put my, my email address at the beginning. I think that my okay. email address is probably the, uh, the best to use. Um, the other thing, uh, the other thing I want to say, if anybody wanted to volunteer as a reviewer, of course, we, we're always looking for reviewers. We're also hoping the reviewers will, be, like I said, uh, one of the best ways to get educated about Software X and, and submit your own articles. And yes, by all means, send us any questions. Those were very good questions uh, after the presentation today. So, uh, and in particular, the impact factor, I think, would be another, would be uh, something for us to review uh, again. And and um, it's I think it's important for the community from the perspective of you know publishing so is important argument developing the argument. So thank you for that. 
All right. Well, thank you. And um, with your uh, uh, permission here, we're going to move on to the, the rest of the meeting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so thank you very much. If it's okay, I will, um, I will uh, hang up now. Okay. okay. Thanks, thank you, Kate. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Thanks.